today I have Samantha Wynn on my channel to talk about all things related to your career. There is a lot of overlap with Zack Snyder's work, so obviously he'll come up at some point as well. But thank you for joining me today, Samantha. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you again. We've got yeah, it's really nice forward. to see you. Uh, how are you feeling just in a general sense now that the film is out? Because the last time we talked, Army of the Dead had not come out yet. It, yeah, I feel like it's new waves of like being overwhelmed and excited every single day, especially as Netflix releases these new assets. Today, it was the uh, number one worldwide on Netflix release. So that blew my mind all, or, all over again. I feel like every time I'm just recovering and getting myself together again, something else just frazzles me and blows me to pieces. And, and uh, today it's that. So it just touches me to know that people all over the world are enjoying Army of the Dead and that I could have been a part of it. And it just, I, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> and you have become a huge fan favorite character, by the way. I don't know how much you're online and paying attention to fan <laughs> discourse. I've already seen fan cams. Do you know what fan cams are? What? No, what are those? Oh, then I should find one and send you one. Uh, not right now, because we're in the middle of an interview, but basically it's, they're usually in a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. They're usually edited on mobile phones, but basically people will take footage of either an actor or a celebrity or a character that they really like, and they just kind of cut it together. They put nice filters on to make it really aesthetic, and they'll usually have some really glossy pop song or some sort of mood music, depending on the vibe that they want to go for. But I've seen Chambers fan cams already, so. Oh my gosh, that's so touching. I saw uh, a couple cosplay outfits and I was like, oh my God, like to be a part of, I guess, uh, pop culture and history that way is just insane to me. <laughs> yeah, I think, a lot of people were of the same mentality as myself of you should have survived longer. I can at least get <laughs> in the fact that, oh, we can talk spoilers, right? Because the film is out. Spoiler alert for like Zack yeah. Snyder's Justice League, Army of the Dead and Sucker Punch, since we're going to talk about that at some point too. So like- If you haven't seen that yet and you're watching <laughs> this video, then that's on you, I think. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I think you should have lived longer because you had the coolest action scene. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, spoiler alert, uh, it seems like most of us had to go at some time. So for me, I was just so happy I got to go in the way that I did. It felt pretty epic and it felt, it. Uh, there was just so much adrenaline from the whole fight and everything leading up to it that when it finally got to that moment, I felt like Chambers as well as Sam was ready. I was ready to go. It, it felt earned. So um, that for me was more important than, than how long I may or may not have survived. But uh, the deaths in, in this movie were so epic and each person had truly their own moment with it that um, I feel like that almost resonates more than the times that we were alive, which I feel like a good zombie movie should do with you. So I'm, I'm a happy camper. So of course this is a Zack Snyder film, but that is not the only Snyder that you've collaborated with. You did, um, uh, I guess you would be like a profile piece for Hoppa Mag and uh, let me see where can I find the, I have this open in a different tab, but uh, the makeup artist is Willow Snyder. Yes, that is right. I, I first met Willow, I don't remember, it might have even been on like Man of Steel set or something, but she was kind of just a kid at that time. But um, I got to work with her on Snow Steam Iron. She was also the makeup artist. And I just thought she did such an amazing job. You can look at, you know, the, the style of that character. And I feel like the beautiful makeup is part of what stands out about uh, Lynn in Snow Steam Iron. And so, um, when the opportunity came to work with a makeup artist for this shoot, and so much of it was centered around Army of the Dead and the Snyders, I was just feeling so much love for the family and for Stone Quarry. I thought if Willow is available and free, and she's also the most talented makeup artist I know, I would love to have that. That would be amazing. So, And uh, one of the things that you mentioned in that article was that you wish that more people would ask you about your parents because yeah. you want to talk about your parents. So what is it that you want to say about your parents? 
I guess I, I just want more opportunities to tell everyone how amazing they are. They're just such humble people in Canada and they have uh, very normal jobs. My mom is an accountant. My dad is a, a day trader and works from home. But they are just the most loving, happy, supportive people in in like all of the best ways possible. So any chance I get to say how amazing my parents are in the hopes that maybe they'll see the interview and and it'll touch their hearts, then that makes me super happy. <laughs> Another thing I noticed when looking through just different trivia about you is that on your IMDb page, you've been credited throughout your career with different names. So is there a particular reason for that? Because I get that maybe you kind of change it once, or, but it, I think there were at least three different ones. And I, I was wondering what the motivation was behind that. Yeah, you know, that's something that I, I probably should have planned more going in. Um, no particular reason other than life changes and my name was just changing along with it. And I should have just stuck to like one professional name, but I don't know, I guess I I, I, I went for it. So Samantha Wynn is definitely going to be my, my, last, my last name change. It is my first and middle name and that is, that is, uh, that is me. That is, that's it though, I promise. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if there was any sort of cultural struggles because I know that Ming-Na Wen, who you've worked with on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., she's had different, either just Ming-Na or Ming-Na Wen. And then also Pedro Pascal has kind of gone through a trial of error before he finally just stuck with Pedro Pascal to do with kind of sounding too ethnic or whatever and being put into a box because of that. So he kind of experimented, but then he didn't, want to remove his culture so then he kind of went back so I wasn't sure if that was involved at all in any of the no your journey with names yeah no it I am aware of 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 that being a thing 100 percent um but it was even even when my last name was Joe J-O it's still a, a Korean last name actually but it was just um when it was my maiden name and then my married name and now it's my first and middle name. So all of them really are my my ethnic names. I just didn't plan very well when it came to changing it professionally. I should have I should have stuck with one name professionally, but ah, whatever. That's life. No one's life is is so clear cut. <laughs> so I'm really happy to have you on because much like myself, you are half Asian and mm -hmm. it was really interesting reading through your profile piece on Hapa Mag because you were talking about when you were doing wushu and you were at the Olympics and kind of that journey of feeling like you had more so earned the right to claim your Chinese heritage. I'm Japanese, by the way, just for anyone who's wondering or uh, tuning in for the first time that doesn't know. Um, mm -hmm. But it was just interesting to hear you talk about that because I feel like that's almost something that's not talked about enough when we talk mm -hmm. about diaspora Asians or Mm -hmm. mixed Asians, um, you know, because even canonically mixed Asian characters, a lot of times mm -hmm. Hollywood kind of Asian washes them where they don't actually allow mixed performers to play those characters. Yeah. So uh, do you want to talk a bit about that more uh, in a personal sense of maybe how that interacts with your career in Hollywood and kind of navigating being mixed and you know how other people project their ideas of Asianness onto you maybe 100% i think being mixed is is one of those things where it is a double edged blade because on the one side of things you're more ambiguous so you can be cast in characters that aren't as clear cut or maybe they are supposed to be from another world or some sort of unique uh, race or people from a, a fantasy kind of world. So in that regard, being mixed really does uh, help and play a valuable purpose. But on the other side of things, if it's anything to do with coming right from China or with a Chinese accent or living overseas, I, I have gotten the not Asian enough kind of look. So I, I guess in that part, it can be frustrating because there's nothing I can really do about that. I'm I'm not white enough, but I'm not Asian enough. So if a, if a role is for a Caucasian or Asian, I I don't usually get cast or or put in those positions. And when I read for them, there's even an element of myself that feels like I'm not what they're looking for. And I know that that is my own 
fear about it because perhaps the casting directors really are open about it. But I think when the role is presented in a certain way, and especially specifically Asian with maybe some sort of stereotypical Asian background, like a, a strict mom upbringing, and she's fulfilling the shoes of her father's company, stepping into that kind of tiger mom, tough Asian woman role, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. And I, I don't feel like that is my casting. So work, you know, it's hit and miss. Sometimes it's a win, sometimes it's not. But I do feel like every, every ethnicity has a similar struggle. Maybe it's not that exactly, but we, we do all have our struggles with it, I know. Um, on a personal side of things, I really enjoy being mixed because I feel like I get to indulge in all of the celebrations and wonderful traditions of both cultures and many other cultures because I feel like I'm not as easily put into a box of, this must have been your background. People are more open when they meet me and more curious about what my background and upbringing really was like. So I don't get some of those stereotypes imposed on me. Yeah, it was pretty interesting to see when Wonder Woman 1984 came out and Pedro Pascal's character has a son who is visibly Asian and there were non-Asians saying that it was diversity casting. Meanwhile, come to find out, I looked up the actor, he's half Latin, half Asian. So it's like, even when we get a job for something, yeah. you know, people have all these types of opinions on it. And it was almost more offensive that a lot of the people who were criticizing that casting were trying to like get angry on behalf of Asians. And it's yeah. like, no, actually, you're being really disrespectful and offensive to like our shared life experience as mixed Asians. But I feel like that was such yeah. a typical thing for what like, life is like for us. I can see that. It would be a really hard thing if I were cast in a role for uh, an Asian role and someone said that casting me was whitewashing. That would be so frustrating and infuriating because I... I what do the mixed people do? You don't fit in anywhere. And we're just trying to tell the stories as well. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think casting a mixed Asian person or a mixed ethnicity person is whitewashing. I actually really appreciate it because it's opening up the world of possibility for our castings because really then we would only have casting breakdowns that said ambiguous or uh, it could be anyone. And you know, that's just, that bit really limits you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was curious how ethnicity comes into play when doing stunt work, because of course your professional background in the industry is stunts. So uh, I think my personal favorite or one of my favorite stunt gigs that you did was for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because you did a lot of doubling for Ming-Na Wen, who is yeah. iconic as we've already established. Yes. But um, yeah, so is that something that they do take more into account to try to match ethnicities or is it just kind of a more technically focused? Cause it seems like some mm -hmm. stunt performer castings have gotten into trouble because anytime you are like changing someone's skin color, then, and if people online find out about it, then they get really upset. So what uh, perspective can you offer? as someone that's worked in that industry of how ethnicity overlaps with stunt performing, uh, casting stunt performers? So firstly, I do think that we have come a long way, but yes, it, it was and still is more so before, but a big issue with um, casting a um, Caucasian stunt double for a person of color actor. And so it, it limits the opportunities for other stunt people that are people of color coming up in the industry because it, it inhibits their ability to gain experience and to make those connections and really start to build and establish themselves in their own careers. But um, I do feel like more recently, but even more so with the diversity and stunts movement actually started by my partner Shahab as well, um, it really shed a new light on that issue within the stunt community. And so I do feel like it is at the forefront of everyone's minds right now. And there's being there's a conscious effort being made uh, by many of the leaders who everyone who posted this diversity and stunts banner with kind of a, a, a promise or a commitment to do better in that regard. Um, 
it includes so many influential people and so many of the people that are able to give jobs right now. So this commitment has been made and I do feel like I'm seeing the fruits of that labor and there are more people of color in nondescript positions. If there's a person of color actor, um, there's more of an effort made to match the stunt double ethnically as well so that opportunities are uh, are flowing for everyone. So I, I'm, I'm really proud of that. And I think that diversity in stunts has been a, a huge step forward. So of course, one of your first big gigs was Sucker Punch and you were Jenna Malone's stunt double. So do you want to talk a bit about the experience of I see. doing that it's job? That you put me in that box, you're like, you say this and then you double the cocky. Well, this is from 2011. <laughs> so, and also yeah. I think the optics are completely different when you're casting a person of color to stunt double for a white person versus like painting a white person brown or black yeah. to play, you know, it's or, not the same, in my personal opinion, but you know, I'm actually, neither brown nor black, so. <laughs> I think it actually goes back to our, our former point of casting when it comes to mixed ethnicity, because I, I actually am equally, should be eligible to double Caucasians as Asians, if we're looking at the flip side of it. So um, for me to not be allowed to double Caucasians is half of my identity. And if I only double Asian, why is that any different from um, a, a uh, I forgot the connection I was making. It's still. <laughs> no, but I get, I get your point, but genuinely the segue was not uh, to talk about <laughs> Um, you doubling for a white person. It was just more like, I love Sucker Punch and I'm <laughs> excited to up. talk to someone that was on that film, so. <laughs> it's just me with like very, it is, the the makeup was, it looked very pale and different on my skin than I <laughs> think on Jenna. And with the blonde hair wig, I'm like, oh, am I putting my foot in my mouth right now? <laughs> no, you're not, you're not. It's cause, I mean, there were some controversies recently that I won't bring up because it has nothing to do with you because it's not, projects that you were on, but there were some revelations to do with, um, you know, a white person basically wearing a brown bodysuit and yes. being painted more brown to play someone who was like ethnically, you know, not white and the stunt yeah. performer was white. So it kind of reignited all those conversations. So I figured I was like, well, you know, it's relevant. She's done a lot of stunt work. So let's talk about that. Oh, so. 100%. And I, I am so proud that Shahab was the uh, one of them that really brought into motion the diversity and stunts movement. So it is something that means a lot to me and an effort that I, I want to actively make in the community. So I'm really happy you brought it up. But, but yeah, I did stunt double Jenna Malone, that is right. And I had an absolute blast because she is one of the loveliest human beings. I feel like you can get a sense of that even if you follow her on her social media. You see, she is a, a free spirit, an individual full of love and just wants to give to the world. What are your thoughts on the recent push that's um, finally reignited a little bit more about the whole, so we had released the Snyder Cut and now it's released the Snyder Punch, uh, which I've had in my Twitter and Vero profile for uh, like a hot minute now. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, um, that's amazing. I didn't know that that hashtag exists, but I'm so happy it does and I feel like now would be the time for that. So why not the uh, original ending of Sucker Punch to be released with all of this uh, renewed, I guess, faith in in the power of the people to 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 get the artist version of their films. Um, that would be amazing. I I am I would be so excited for the world to see the original ending of Sucker Punch. I have not seen it. I know that there's uh, rumors going around that I've, I've seen the ending. I mentioned that I know what it is. I know what the story and what was filmed, but I wasn't, uh, I've never actually seen this cut or I, I don't know that. So just to put that rumor to rest, um, I'm in the boat of everyone else. I know it exists and I know what it should be, but um, I don't know. I, I, I'm just as, as hopeful to see it as you guys. So is the main difference between the versions that we already have, there's the theatrical version, there's the extended version, those are already out. Is the main difference just there's a different ending or is it significantly different from your understanding of having worked on the project? You don't have to give specifics because I'm not trying to get you in trouble, but just in a very vague general sense. 
Um, luckily, I don't know anything but a, a vague general sense um, because I have not seen this other other cut. So I don't know in which ways it may or may not differ because you can you can shoot six months of footage and have a movie out of it, but using that exact same footage, you can cut it completely different to be telling a completely different story. So it it could or couldn't be, I, I, I really couldn't say, I don't know. I do know that there is uh, a different ending, but that is all that I really have knowledge of. And I only say it because I, I would like to be a part of that and put the pressure on people to, to or people that have the, the money for it to, um, fund and support that release. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, everyone make sure you're uh, posting with the hashtag or put it in your bio or whatever whatever your preferred methodology is. Cause I, I like, I love that film. Like, I think it's honestly, I think it's Zach's most underrated film because it's just, like the fact that it was basically addressing Me Too six years before the Me Too movement officially happened um, mm -hmm. is pretty, incredible to think about you know as far as we can tell this very privileged you got a rich successful white man who's using his platform to go yeah i'm gonna make a really cool visually stunning blockbuster but we're also going to talk about the misogynistic ways that women are treated by men you know and i think it's applicable he always puts it in the context of kind of the industry, whether it's the gaming industry or the entertainment industry, but I think it's so applicable to just like so much more than just that. So yeah, it, it is one of those things. I feel like if it were released now, people would understand the meaning easier. But at that time, it was accused of the very thing that it was trying to expose. So um, it just wasn't it wasn't understood by some people at that time. But a lot of people love, luckily could see it and, and appreciate it for what it really is. But um, yeah, I, I do think it would be a different tune being sung if if they had seen it now. Yeah, I stand firm firmly by the fact that Oscar Isaac in that film mm -hmm. is more or less the scariest villain I've ever seen in anything. Like when he starts going, he starts yeah. yelling at the girls. I'm just going, oh no, oh no. I just tense up, I'm going, oh yeah. no, 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 no. I need to run away. <laughs> I remember there was a in in that scene or in a scene later he like pushes baby doll up against a, a a mirror dresser and he's being intimidating and he like is holding the key or she's holding the key around his neck or something. I don't remember exactly um the part but she gets pushed into the the shelving and um so I was in the baby doll outfit for that in that day and so I was right in front of him while he's he was doing his whole thing and I was terrified. <laughs> I was 18 too. So I'm like, wow, that, I think this person is just an excellent actor because yep, I'm very creeped out and terrified and I cannot look him in the eye. <laughs> that is that is how I felt. So he is brilliant, but he's such a nice person outside of that. So it was very much a safe environment because yeah. you, you call Cotter, you see him in the gym later and he's like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'm like, oh. You <laughs> <laughs> know, it's just interesting because I didn't know that you would be the person that's getting shot. But I mean, I guess it is a, a stunt, but I it mm. never even occurred to me that that wouldn't be her. But that's a, that's that's why I'm reacting. It's not me going oh no, I think Oscar Isaac is actually like that. It's yeah. like, oh, she had to get shoved into a mirror. It's like, hi, welcome to your first movie. Yeah. It's time to shove you into yeah. a mirror. <laughs> Yeah, it you know, it on set it's always such a, a lovely environment. So when it comes to filming something like that, it's very obviously make believe when everyone around you is nice and smiling and happy, you're like, ah, this is this is just part of the job. And for me, a value part a valuable part of the job because I got to witness such a moment and like him really being in his character uh so up close with him. So it was a, a very um treasured actor experience for me, I guess. But uh, yeah, when you're working with a large group like that, there'll be times when there's already a fight being shot on second unit or first unit. So like Emily and Heidi Moneymaker, who's also Black Widow's stunt double, but she was doubling Baby Doll in this. Uh, they're already on one unit and they're doing uh, a different scene that also involves Baby Doll on another unit. So sometimes it's just a numbers thing. Like we need another Baby Doll 
whose um, skin, height, body kind of matches best out of who's on contract. So that was the reasoning for it, because I, I know that Heidi and Emily, of course, would have been able to do stellar at it, but uh, they were preoccupied at the moment. So, of course, another one of your uh, famous Zack Snyder roles or appearances is so you both stunt doubled as Feora, the character, but then you were also Carvex, an actual character that exists in the film. So were you just cast as a stunt performer? And then the like once you're making the film, they decided to also make you your own character? Or did you know early on that you would be doing both? Um, I don't know what the order of decisions was, but for me, the experience was that I was hired as the Feora stunt double. And when I showed up for the wardrobe fitting, there were all of these other outfits for me to try on as Carvex. And so that was where I learned that I'd be able to contribute as a small character as well. So it was a, a really exciting day because I, I had no idea. I just walked in and, and discovered things from the costumers as if I, I should have known and it was no big deal. So I'm like, oh yeah, no big deal. Oh my God. Like I was so, I was so excited internally. <laughs> so another job of yours was to be in Wonder Woman, the 2017 film. Mm -hmm. So I know that you get asked a lot about Zach, but I also wanna make sure that since you've appeared in Wonder Woman that we also give you the opportunity to talk about that gig and also working with Patty as a director. Cause I think it's so weird. Cause on the one hand, Patty is so famous now because she's done these two Wonder Woman films. They've been these huge, you know, blockbusters mm -hmm. that everybody knows those films. But I think her story is so interesting where she got to be a part of this, uh, you know, Oscar winning, she made this Oscar winning film, awesome. but then she went many years not being able to make a new film because I mean I've heard some things about the industry I'm not going to claim to know more about that situation <laughs> than I do but the vibe that I've gotten from what I've heard is basically that the industry is very sexist so it was very difficult for her to secure funding for the projects that she wanted to make so mm -hmm. that's why you have this long stretch of her mm -hmm. not getting to make a new film even though she was one of the you know people in the Oscar award show circuit with monster and then and then it took her that long to just make this film so you know wow. your experience and also working with patty um first I, I i wouldn't put it past that that may be of what may be what was happening i know that the the dialogue going around was that um you know women had less experience directing but you know the only way to gain experience is to <laughs> let women direct so it was one of those um chicken or the egg fights that that were happening. But I think, again, we're on a positive trajectory with that now. Uh, but my experience on that was that it was A, so lovely to have a woman who came from an athletic background. Uh, Patty was a speed skater before. And so I think she was able to really bond with and lead the Amazons in a way that um, many directors wouldn't have been able to. Uh, and also the fact that she's a woman and, and it was a very female centric not just female centric, it is an entire island of warrior women. So you need to have that kind of leader on a kind of project like that. And Patty was that and more. She was just a, a, a beacon of light everywhere she went. She was so respectful and supportive and caring towards everybody. It, uh, it, and I personally going in being such a fan of Monster, had so much respect and admiration, it, it made the experience um, unmatched, I would say. Between her and Gao being the people they are, the, the very kind-hearted, spirited people, um, I, I, it makes me happy that the world was able to see that and that Wonder Woman became this beloved film because I think that it was, it was well-earned. So of course I wanna make sure we also talk about Snow Steam Iron, which I think is really underrated. Uh, obviously, well, a lot of Zach's fans, I feel like they've watched it just cause they, you know, they kind of make sure to check off the list of watching everything. But I think it so perfectly encapsulates so much of what Zach is constantly doing with his films. There too, right? Willow's makeup, she, she just does amazing. <laughs> yeah. Between her and, and the special effects, um, Logan, they, they really 
did a team. Anyway, sorry. I, I just yeah. love the makeup on, on Snow Steam Iron that it, yeah, it really gets me. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks great. And it's just, it's so like spot on. Of You have a really beautiful, strong woman kicking butt, but also it's got this really heavy socio-political commentary about the misogynistic violence that women are constantly being subjected to. And that's just perpetually running through almost every film that Zach does. It was in ARMY as well. I mean, that's Theo mm -hmm. Rossi's entire character is there for that reason, to deliver that message and that reminder. I felt like my character was the 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 modern voice of what the dialogue should be. So I, I felt happy to get that role. <laughs> felt good. Yeah, but, I just, um, I love that he shot it with an iPhone too. That's incredible. Oh yeah, Snow Steam Iron was a, a special project for many reasons, but uh, the fact that it was such a powerful and widespread commentary on that subject matter, I mean, me as a woman, I feel so proud to be a part of that. I feel like I've been lucky enough to be cast in projects that are forward thinking and are steps in the right direction. So uh, I'm, I'm really lucky that young girls are able to see the characters I've played and it's a healthy thing for them. I really wanna be uh, a positive, healthy thing for young people that may be watching content I'm in instead of um, you know, taking work that is maybe um, in my mind an outdated mindset or something that I, I don't necessarily think um, people or kids should be looking up to as a, as a role model. So I, I, feel, I feel grateful that that has not been the case. In my opinion, I'm doing the best I can. And also uh, thank you for the opportunities because it's, it's not my call on which projects I get to jump on. It's a, I have to <laughs> be offered an opportunity and then choose to take it. So the, the offering part of it is so out of my control. I'm really grateful. <laughs> Another thing I probably should have checked with you before we started recording is, am mm -hmm. I allowed to ask about specific spoilers related to your short film, Unwelcome? Because the subject matter of that short is pretty identical to what's being addressed in Snow Steam Iron, but I, I don't know if this is like a spoiler episode where we can talk about it, or if you don't want to talk about spoilers because it's your short, like you can make that call. Um, I think it's, up to you. I feel like uh, the only thing is that if anyone watching right now, uh, okay, so we can talk spoilers, but let me just say for anyone watching right now, if you haven't seen Unwelcome yet, just press pause. It's 11 minutes. It's a, a thriller with a twist. There's a very dramatic genre twist halfway through, and it touches on some of the um, messages that we've just been talking about. So please go check it out right now. Pause, do it, and then come back because we are about to ruin it for you. Yeah, and it's only 11 <laughs> minutes. So I'll link it in the description box too for anyone who wants to watch it, but. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, go check it out. And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't sure what, it, you know, what inspired you to want to, I mean, besides just living life as a woman, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to, because you're more involved in creating that story from the ground up, uh, deciding that that's what you wanted to address. Cause I know that now that we can talk about spoilers, when it got to the part where you're with, um, thankfully he's your real life partner. So I'm assuming everything is actually good, but it's not going so well in the actual short. And um, when I was watching that and uh, your character's friend is just sitting there not doing anything. I was like, that's your friend. You better get up and go help her. I was getting so mad, but you know, obviously um, you were in the short, you're more than capable of defending yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I was so mad in the heat of the moment. I was like, get up, that's your friend. You need to have your friends back. She's about to get assaulted. Like, what are you doing? But yeah. So funny. Uh, I'm so glad it was evoking that kind of reaction. But yeah. the, the uh, intention going into it 100% was, uh, wanting to touch on uh, the themes of, of complicity and these gray areas, and I say that with my quotation fingers, um, when it comes to things like this, really exploring all of the different dialogues that happen on the male side of things, on the female side of things, and being able to, to show what that really looks like. I know if you're in a moment, you can think, like if you were Kyle's character, played by Dustin Stern Garcia, 
you can think that, oh, I still said something. Oh, I was uncomfortable. Oh, I tried to encourage my friend to do differently. But when you look at it from the outside perspective of watching the short film, uh, you can see that is still very wrong. And there are still uh, many ways to improve yourself as a human being. And it is very hurtful to other people. So um, going into that, we, we knew that we wanted to touch on uh, complicity and we knew that we wanted to have a strong message while also being in the pandemic, wanting to create something together with um, time on our hands and motivation in our hearts. And so um, sitting down with my partner Shahab and our co-producer Don, we were just kind of spitballing stories back and forth about uh, ways that we could present it so that we weren't contributing to kind of the the ache in our hearts that was going on because of all of the world events at the time, um, but still having a powerful message with it. Because if we're going to create something, we want it to lend itself toward a positive step in humanity. Um, and so it, it was that balance of, we know everyone is already heavy hearted right now. So if there's a way that we could make it an enjoyable experience, we wanna do that. And we hope that once that twist happens, the satisfaction makes it an enjoyable experience for everyone. So um, I guess I can't say spoilers now. The moment the shit hits the fan and the fangs come out and the blood goes everywhere, I think it that creates enough excitement to make up for all the, the tension and uncomfortable feelings earlier in the film. But um, yeah, that was, that was it. We sat down and uh, Shahab and I wrote it together and he has had so much experience directing short films touching on this subject matter already. Um, he's a very sensitive, beautiful human being. And so um, I feel like this is an important, just as important for him, oh, oh my sweetheart, <laughs> <laughs> as, as it is for me as a woman. And so I, I felt like we were in excellent hands. I think if a man is going to be telling this kind of story, they have to be very uh, sensitive and aware and on the same page and understanding of what that experience really is like on the female side of things. And I, I do think he understands it. And I think uh, that comes across watching it. So, of course, we need to talk about Zack Snyder's Justice League because it's <laughs> one of the biggest cultural events of the entire year. And of course, you were very visible. I mean, you're always visible in Zack's projects nowadays, but um, you know, you're visible to a whole other degree because you are getting to be prominently seen on screen and you have a very memorable death. And like, you know, you want it, it's cool to have a, a an iconic death. Like Sean, Sean Bean has made a career of just dying iconically. It's so funny. I, I, I've been hearing that more recently, like comparing me to being Zach's Sean Bean. <laughs> It's just gonna kill me and everything. <laughs> um, but I love it. I, I think as an actor, death scenes are, there's so much. And I feel like as a human, getting to attempt to experience something like that, like everything that goes through your, it just, it inspires a whole other level of reflection, not just on a character's life, but on your own life. And so getting to do that over and over and over, <laughs> um, I feel like I'm, probably growing as a person as well. But death scenes are just so fun. And I feel like even when you're a kid acting out, um, you know, um, cops and robbers or something, and then someone shoots you and you have this dramatic death and you see this like five-year-old who's like fully in the moment of being shot and dying. Um, there's something in us that wants to, I guess, ev evoke that kind of empathy from people. Uh, I'm not sure what the instinct behind it is, but it is just a fun thing to be able to act it out. And I guess that's a trigger warning as well, because people who have really experienced terrible things in, in war and other areas, I get that that is not some sort of um, fun fantasy. But uh, I have lived a very sheltered life with lovely parents and an, an amazing family. And so um, acting out death scenes for me feels very far removed from my own life and something I can appreciate. Uh, there, that's the, the PG answer of it. But um, the image of me under a horse is something I will always cherish. I think it's, it's funny. <laughs> and I knew that I was kind of gonna be the horse Amazon when, when all was said and done. And I feel like that is an honor Everyone knows who the the horse Amazon is. It was just such a such an image. 
Mm -hmm. But it's also very emotionally impactful. You know what I mean? It's not just a death for the sake of a death. You know, I mean, Star Trek, it's sort of a running joke of, oh, don't be the person wearing the red shirt when you go on the mission uh, onto a strange new planet. But it's like, even though you don't know a ton about that character, like you do some of the more uh, higher build characters, uh, you still really feel like like an emotional gut punch that, mm. you know, that she's another casualty to Thank you. I, I, I think Zach um, really did an amazing job of, and giving me the opportunity of representing kind of all of the Amazons in that one character. Uh, because the queen, all of the Amazonians are her her people, her women. It's such a, a part of her identity and her spine that the hardest part for her and the audience, uh, you know, we're, we're meant to be connecting with the queen and her experience in this moment. Um, Eubea, who was by her side is kind of the, the avenue in which we can, we can feel what the queen is feeling. So she can look at Eubea and feel these things, but Eubea is just a representative. It really is all Amazonians. And so I, I was lucky I got to, to play that character that got to be the representative, but it's, it's the, the dying of um, an innocence and an era of empowerment that they were feeling on the island. It kind of blew everything that they know and loved to pieces. And that was shown through Eubea's death. And so, um, yeah, it, it was impactful. And it was, even though a version of that was in the theatrical cut, holding on some of those moments, extra moments with Connie Nielsen's um, face and everything she was feeling and her holding my hand, just letting those moments breathe gave the, the scene a totally different tone and weight that I didn't even realize would have been there. So it, it was a special surprise to see how different that scene felt in Zach's version versus the theatrical version. So I do want to make sure we leave enough time to talk about Army of the Dead a little bit more. Uh, a lot of your interactions were with Raul Castillo mm -hmm. as Mikey Guzman. So how was that to get to work so closely with him and kind of make that sort of goofy, fun energy. I know there's that really cute shot of the two of you kind of taking selfies together before yeah. this big, scary, dangerous mission. I just thought, <laughs> oh, I feel like he's making fun of, you know, millennials and Gen Z, but it's funny, so I'll allow it. <laughs> yeah. um, it was such a, a great experience. Uh, I was, I had so many, um, like fears kind of going into it because I, from my perspective, everyone was these established actors and they'd had these amazing careers. And here I come in, I've, I've done like small roles and big projects, a lot of stunt work, just a different background from everyone else it seemed. And so I wasn't really sure what at their level the actor's process really was. So I was kind of quiet and like looking around, like, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? Do do they collaborate on things like this? Um, and I was really grateful that Raul came over instantly to um, talk about characters and how we saw our backstory because we were introduced as um, ride or die homies from the beginning. What do we think that looked like? And so um, we tried to adapt this like kind of brother sister dynamic because even if we weren't actually brother and sister, because you know, we, we look like different ethnicities in, in real life. <laughs> How could we make that work? And we probably came up on the streets and um, there's a, a familial aspect to it. And the more we leaned into that, I think, um, the, the more it was felt on camera. And I think it made both deaths and that kinship um, add a, a layer of emotion into those scenes. And I, I hope that it was felt by people. Um, we had a lot of fun shooting it. And I think I think you are lucky as an actor and character to have another person in a story that cares about you because the audience can then feel through that other character's pain, your death, and in turn, um, have a stronger feeling about your character. So I think, um, uh, he's largely responsible for the emotions felt about my character's death. If no one really cared about her, it wouldn't have been a big deal. So uh, for me, that was the most important and, and delightful thing about it. I also wanted to share this photo because it made me laugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh God, Garrett is... 
Garrett is such an amazing person and all of the the like empathy hate he's getting from from people just hating his character so much. Um, it's it's funny. I hope he's OK. I, I mean, I'm sure he is. He's he's a professional, but he just does such a, an amazing job at making people love to hate him in this film. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I was all in my feelings. I was like, that's my girl. You better not go anywhere near her. And then he just kept anyway. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's too soon, you know, cause I saw it kind of recently. I couldn't see it when it first came out cause I had just gotten my second shot. So I was asleep in bed all day, just mm -hmm. trying to get rid of a fever that I had. Uh, I haven't had a fever in I don't know how many years. Um, <laughs> it was so weird watching the film and there's all these like take the temperature and all this stuff. And I'm just going, be like, Zach, can you stop no. revealing that you're actually psychic? You always do this. <laughs> always a few steps ahead of the curve. Yeah, but uh, it, it was so lovely to work with Garrett. He He's one of them that I, I had such a respect for his career going into it. So I was probably somewhat most intimidated, but because he was one of the most welcoming, supportive kind cast i mean really everyone on the cast was but i got to interact with him a lot in the film so i was i was really grateful that um him being so amazing and established was was kind to my little old actor self and and kind of um gave me that respect through the scenes so that i didn't feel any sort of insecurity or self-consciousness i felt like we were there working together as an ensemble and it didn't matter what anyone's backgrounds were. Um, he really made me feel a part of the experience and uh, is an amazing person to work off of. He made so many creative choices uh, that weren't in the, the, that didn't make the cut because you know, you have to pick one, but you could make 10 different versions of that scene that are equally entertaining with his performances. He is just fantastic. I also love that in one of the first shots that we see of you where it's the sort of kind of fantasy of what the mission will be like, the mm -hmm. fact that now you have to know something about me. I'm a huge stan of the 2000s Charlie's Angels films. So what the fact that when they're doing the slow pan across you and you, you did one of these oh. and I was like, oh, another Asian queen doing the hair flip. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know what it would uh I, I wasn't aware of the Charlie's Angels reference in it. I'm so happy that that well, that yeah, Lucy Liu that, has like multiple hair flips. It's like canonically part of her character. It's just been so long since I I've I've seen it. But the reasoning behind it was because this was a the fantasy of Tanaka. So this is him saying the ideal version of how it goes. And I'm like, oh well, I should I should represent myself and how I think Tanaka would see me. <laughs> so that's where the hair flip came from. I don't think that Chambers really would would take the moment to necessarily, do, maybe actually, but I do think that Tanaka or a, like a man's perspective of of Chambers being back-to-back -back shooting probably entails like glamor and hair flips. So <laughs> that was the, the motivation. Yeah, well, because to be very clear, I don't see hair flipping as just like a male gaze or male fantasy thing. Because if I see a fierce badass woman flipping her hair, I'm like, yes, exactly. That's right. That's Period. Right. <laughs> I probably would actually. But uh, at the time, my thought was, oh, I'm going to be clever and do this. But either way, I think it works because hell yeah, she, she's got hoops and a crop top and she is she is uh, on point style wise. So she's earned it. <laughs> Yeah, let me get the character poster. Um, yeah. You look so cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I uh, I was so excited about the the overall look that uh, hair, makeup, and the costumer Stephanie Porter uh, gave gave my character. It, she is so much more badass than I really am as a person. So when I got to dress like her, I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. I should I should adapt a little bit more of this into my life. <laughs> that that's actually the best part about acting. I feel like you can take snippets of things you're learning as characters, and if you like it, try to um, try to adapt it into yourself. So of course, the man of the hour, the man of 2021, more or less, Zack yes. Snyder. I know you get asked about him all the time, which is why I wanted to make sure that we covered loads of other things before asking <laughs> anything just directly about him. But uh, being that you have such an extensive career of, 
you've done stunts on numerous projects, not just with him, but just stunts just in Hollywood with loads of different directors. So what is it that you think makes him so special as a director, being that he is someone that you've worked with so many times over the course of your career? I think it's his ability to really uh, connect with and care about all of the cast, all of the crew, anyone working with him in any regard. Uh, you can feel that he sees you as a human being and he doesn't see hierarchy, he doesn't see job position. He just sees a person working with him towards making a project and that is enough to, to, to bond with. Um, I think everyone will tell you, you can frequently see him playing catch with like the lighting department um, or like the uh, electrical department or like some grips at lunch. Like he'll just bring a football and be like, he'll point at someone and be like, catch. And then suddenly you're in a game of catch or football with the director and it doesn't matter who you are, but he just, he, he bonds with and really appreciates and cares about everyone on set. And so I, I think that that is a very unique, special thing about him. Um, and I think it's proven in that after I worked with him on Sucker Punch, I was a stunt double for Jenna Malone, but you know, most of my interactions were still through my own boss or the stunt coordinator, Damon Caro at the time. So I, I wasn't around Zach as much, but I was, uh, you know, I was a part of the project and just in that world, there was so much care and love amongst the cast and crew that when I moved to LA, he, he wrote me a letter for my green card. And I thought, how, how special and generous and amazing is that, that uh, after one project together, he like, would help me in such a, a grand and amazing way. And it's not even just that because uh, Debbie Snyder is also who introduced me to um, casting directors and ultimately my manager who I love so dearly. And so uh, I know I'm not the only person that they have done things like this for. There is such care and they just go so above and beyond for their cast and crew and people that they work with. Um, you feel truly valued as a human being. and. And I, I, I don't know what other words to use than that because it is a very profound, special thing. And if you are so lucky to find a group of people like that, that you can work with so that your career is this happy life and you have a, a happy home life, like it in life. And so for those reasons, I can die happy. I, I am so grateful to have worked with the Snyders and um, anyone that gets a chance to work with Zach, you should jump on it. I know that the Snyders, uh, both Zach and Deborah, Debbie, sometimes I feel weird calling her Debbie because I'm like, I don't know her. Is that weird for me to call her that? Um, but uh, they've really <laughs> championed diversity for their projects. So mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective as someone who works in the industry and not just with them, mm -hmm. is that the key to making more diversity happening is like people who are in charge of I guess the creative side of making the projects, mm -hmm. is that how we can finally get more diversity to happen? Because it just feels like there's so much, there's so much pushback against diversity on the one hand from some people where they think it's just like checking a box or they just don't want to do it because they just don't yeah. like doing something different or, you know, like what, because they've been so consistent. I mean, I geeked out. As soon as I found out Hiroyuki Sanada was in this, I was like, oh my God, my king. My and, king is in there, and he will not be playing just the generic disposable bad guy. Like, yes, I'm shading a certain blockbuster that he appeared in that wasn't a Zach film where they treated him like an anonymous Asian baddie. I'm like, that's our like legend. Don't do that to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that there are uh, several ways we have to attack it. Um, I think one of them is yes, by leading leading by example puts pressure on other filmmakers to kind of keep up in that regard. Because the more we see uh, diverse casts represented in the way that we were as fleshed out human beings, interchangeable, none of us, none of our identities were based on our uh, ethnic background or our uh, race or anything like that. You could swap out any of the cast members. Nora could have been Dieter, uh, Matthias could have been Chambers, like it, anyone could have been swapped out. And so 
the more that that becomes a norm for people, the more pressure it puts on people leaning into stereotypes to not do that anymore. It becomes more obvious to the general audience. So I think that is one way. But another way is um, I think certain regulations or standards and uh, ways to kind of help push people into, into moving forward with us. So whether that looks like in however many studio films at this studio per year, um, these size of roles are in, in like the top billing or main cast has to have at least X amount of people of color for these kinds of roles. I don't know, I, I am a fan of that as well. So that um, in addition to us being encouraged at a certain point, you also don't have a choice. You have to move forward with the rest of the world. Uh, there will always, always be those that are adverse to change. And so um, it's just that extra little nudge for, for that minority of people, hopefully minority of people. But uh, I, I think there's, yeah, many ways of going about it. And my favorite way, the third way, is uh, celebrating when people do make those changes. When there is a film like this that has done such a good job to really make it known and to hit that home for other people because I think it's positive reinforcement. People that maybe were doing it the old way are like, wow, people really love that about this. Maybe we should lean into that more and we'll get that kind of love. So I'm, I'm a fan of that way, but I think all three are important because there are many different people in the world and different ways will resonate with different people. Well, I know you have to get going, but it was so nice to have you on. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with me. Come back anytime, anytime you want to plug something or just have, you know, girl talk. We could just talk about movies. It's totally up to you, but you are welcome anytime. Thank you so much. I had an amazing time and it was so good to see you again. And, and yes, we will have to do this again for the next one. <laughs>